Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Sure. Hello everyone, you're listening to the Turk and Raz podcast. My name is Turk and I'm here with my good buddy Raz. We bring you our thoughts and reactions to what's happening in pop culture today and go back in time to revisit classic films of the 80s and 90s. Hey Raz, what's up? Hey Turk, how you doing? I'm good. I got my glass of eggnog here. How about you? I got mine as well. Cheers, buddy. Cheers to you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're kind of headed into that holiday cheer season. Yep, absolutely. So what do you know, Big Turk? Hmm. Not a lot. What do you know? <laughs> I don't know a lot. Um, I hear you uh, actually just went to the cinema with the misses. I did. Uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how did you like it? It was a good movie. It was yeah. good. Yep. I enjoyed it. Um, Not as good as the 2016 one, right? Well, what sequel is? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but the 2016 yeah, 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 yeah. one. Like, oh, yeah. That one was awesome. No, I never even saw that one, actually. <laughs> but uh, I heard a lot of good things about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this one was good. Had all the right feels, um, the proper fan service, you know, not too much, just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, all the neat little Easter eggs that you could pick out. I'm sure I missed a bunch, but uh, the acting was good. Story was good. Characters were funny. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. Does Slimer make an appearance in this movie? Uh, the name Slimer, I'll say, does not come up in this movie. Oh. But uh, one might say that you know him as Slimer, but they just don't, they don't know him as Slimer because they don't know who Slimer is. Okay. So spoiler alert, if uh, anyone out there hasn't seen the movie, I haven't, so it doesn't matter to me. (laughs) (laughs) So too bad. That's all all I give you. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. So it kind of lived up to the classic. Um, yes, it was a good callback to the classic, um, mm-hmm. you know, gave you some feelings, you know, it made you happy. Yeah. Well, that, that was directed yeah. by Ivan Reitman's son, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Great and, job. And Alan Reitman was right by his side when he was making the film. So what better source could you have for making a movie when you, you know, when your father, the original maker is there mm-hmm. beside you? And it, Ivan is probably good friends with Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray. Yeah. Probably. So you can yeah. probably think fleshing out the story, mm-hmm. they all kind of had their input. Yep. Yeah. No, it was a good movie. I would definitely go see it again. So I would recommend it. Well, it seems like basically people quite enjoyed it. So I, I'm hoping to go see it at some point. Hopefully yeah. I can see it in the cinema because it seems like I missed my window for Dune and I heard that was uh, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't imagine it sticking around too much longer in the theater. It's been out. For about a month now, so I would get on it fast. Yeah, I see it's on video on demand. Yeah. And I was like talking to a good friend, and the friend said, uh, You got to check it out, like at the theater, because a movie like that, mm-hmm. you got to see it in the cinema. Yeah, the, yeah, the scenery, uh, the sound, it's just amazing. Yeah. It's really good. So, well, um, this Christmas season, we're kind of heading into it, as I just said. Um, there's some, some big movies coming out here. Um, outside of the Ghostbusters, we got uh, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, it, that's going to be a good watch because I enjoyed the first one. And I know you did, too. Mm. I actually liked even the second one with Jake Gyllenhaal. I know a lot of people were, were pretty critical of that one, but uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't mm-hmm. bad at all. Because really, that's kind of like really for like Marvel films, the last Marvel film yeah. I actually really enjoyed. Yeah. To be honest. Um, yeah, that's true. Black Widow was kind of <laughs> for you and I. Yeah. It's too bad because she really was awesome in all the other films that she was in. Now, yeah. she wasn't in a solo, but mm-hmm. but she was, you know, as a part of a team. And she was amazing. Uh, I really enjoyed her character, but it seemed like when she had her solo film, it seemed like they wrote her character a little different this time. And I didn't really appreciate that. Yes, yeah, they did. And also, like, just the backstory that they hinted of her with, like, the Red Room and all that. Yeah. I had a different perception of it from what I saw from the previous movies. So maybe that's on me. But it's just, it, it felt flat. Like, yeah. I guess it is. But, like, I mean, it was great to see Scarlett, Scarlett Johansson. Johansson. Oh, there you Scar-Jo. go. Scarjo. Scarjo for short. 
And uh, the yeah. new girl, who plays the new girl, her uh, sister? Or... Oh, I don't even ask me her name because yeah, I can't no. remember. Is I it Russian? Was... Is it a Russian name? Or I don't that... know. I, I don't but know. I, I enjoyed her. So she's like, cute. I, I'd be, I'd she's be down. Cute. I'd yeah. be down to see her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she is. <laughs> yeah, I'd be down to see her in future movies. I thought the actress herself was great. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's oh. not bad. I just, it just felt like the material just wasn't there. No, it wasn't. I was really looking for some good defining moments, and I, I I really can't remember a great defining moment in that film. No. Like, it was almost like her solo film was a little, like, too little, too late. Like, yeah. You wish it, it was too been, late. As far as, like, for Marvel having a big temple film, especially for female, I thought uh, Black Widow should have been first out the gate over Captain Marvel, in my opinion. Because, yeah. you know, we got to know her in Iron Man 2. And then we we seen her journey through so many films and stuff, and you know I think she had kind of a bittersweet ending. But mm-hmm. Who knows what'll happen in the future? Yeah. Okay. So next on the block is what? Uh well the uh, the big one for you and I is uh, Matrix uh, Resurrections. Yes. So that'll be big. Go right. It's actually a day after my birthday, if you believe it. Ooh, happy so, birthday! Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so that's why we're having the little Christmas eggnog. Yeah. You know, hint, hint. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of uh, the Matrix, it's uh, it's time to get into another retro roundtable. Oh, that's right. Well, uh, what coordinates should I put in there? Well, we we uh, we better hop into the DeLorean first, and uh, oh, you're right. Yeah, I yeah. guess I guess we need the time machine. We need the time machine, so let's get into the DeLorean. All right, let's jump in there. All right, and the coordinates are March thirty first, nineteen ninety nine. All right, put them in. All right. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. Okay, so the Matrix was released in March 31st, 1999. It was directed by the Wachelskis. The movie starred Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss, Lawrence Fishburne, Hugo Weaving, Joe Pataliano. Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh... Fresh from his uh, Goonies roundtable trip. Mm-hmm. So yes. We're, we're, actually, we're really doing this podcast about Joe Patino. Yeah, we're just following his life, right? Yeah, we're going to actually review every movie he's been into. So our next one is going to be Bound. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, the music uh, was uh, scored by Don Davis. 
Uh, the movie actually was budgeted really modestly. It was a uh, 63 million, but the movie gross 466 million at the box office. And this is in 1999. Pretty so good haul. It was a good haul. Uh, and uh, the Matrix is a, a great example of a cyberpunk subgenre, such as like movies like Blade Runner. You see Blade Runner? Uh, you know what? I have not. Well, maybe that's a movie you'll have to see. Yeah, later. don't scorch me for it, please. But you've seen Judge Dredd. <laughs> Years ago, yes. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. Dark Matters, uh, one of his uh, favorite movies. Sly Stallone, right? Sly Stallone. Yeah, yeah. I think I personally prefer the Carl Urban one, the the newer version. Oh, I have it. not seen it's, that one. It's a good one. Uh, okay. That would be one I recommend. Then Alita and Battle Angel. So One of my favorite films. Yeah. And also, like, uh, the Matrix kind of had a similarity to like, The Crow and Dark City. That was a movie I always wanted to see. I hear great things about it. Hmm. Actually, uh, if you kind of look at the trivia there on IMDb, um, The Matrix and Dark City kind of shared sets. Uh, there was a set because the, the films were actually filmed in Australia, both right. films. So. And, of course, uh, Blade. I, I thought a lot of this... Reminded me of Blade when I first saw it. Wow, that sounds like a really good deal. Anyways, 1999 was a big year in films. Star Wars Episode One came out. The Sixth Sense was released in that year. Toy Story 2. Great movie. Tarzan. I love that one. Disney. Yep, that was a good one. That was a good one. Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shaked Me. Very good. <laughs> you like, yeah, you like it. Sleepy Hollow, uh, a movie I like with Johnny Depp. The, the King. <laughs> the Mummy, Brendan yep. Fraser. Oh, excellent. So, yeah, the, just can't be fun stuff. Uh, a James Bond film, The World Is Not Enough. No one cares about that James Bond, to be honest with you. Well, I like ah, Pierce. Oh, oh. I love Pierce. Okay, you like Pierce. Is he yeah. your favorite James Bond? Uh, because I'm not huge into the James Bond genre, like, you know, I don't go deep into the 60s with it, you know, but, um, so, like, I guess my upbringing, I saw a lot of Pierce, so he would be my James Bond. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Just based on how, you know, how I started watching. You might have to set the coordinates a little further back and get you into some Sean Connery. I know, right? Oh, I know. know. I'm sure they're great guys. (laughs) Well, anyways, 1999, um, Fight Club was released in that year. Mm. Um, The Green Mile. Galaxy Quest and Matrix uh, actually was uh, number four worldwide box office that year. Like that's really well. It's in the top five. That's pretty good. Like that movie kind of it hit. Now, when you first saw the Matrix, when did you first see the Matrix, and what was your first impression of it? Well, 1999, I would have been a new father. Uh, I think I would have had probably had a one year old son by then. So, oh, you dirty dog. Chances are I did not go to the theater to see it because I probably couldn't afford it, but uh, I so probably video. watched it on DVD, went to oh. Blockbuster, and, you know, like the good old days, you went in there and perused around the video shelf and read the back of the synopsis of the film, mm-hmm. and, you know, oh, yeah, I like this one, I'll pick it up. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what I did, picked up The Matrix. Yeah. Um, yeah, so watched it at home on probably my shitty tube TV, but uh, that's neither... Here or there, but um, yeah, I, I, obviously I loved it so much that I ended up buying a copy because okay. I loved it so much. Okay. So, okay, yeah. Well, it's something about the Matrix. There's so many ways and routes people discover this movie. That's what's so great about it. Some people discovered it at the theater. Some people discovered it on home video medium. It doesn't matter that, but people discovered this movie. It's just one of those movies you heard by word of mouth, like. For me, I remember seeing actually my first glimpse of this movie was actually at a comic shop in the back of a comic book. I I remember to this day, and I actually went and looked it up online. There's like uh, with the marketing campaign on the back of it had kind of like a fetus with a little unborn child hooked up to stuff. And you just seen like all these dark kind of mechanical like tubes look like it was like inside like I remember room. that I remember and, that and all you seen is like what is the Matrix and you yeah. just like and then you see Keanu Reeves and you see Lawrence Fishburne so you're like well I like Keanu Reeves I like F- Lawrence Fishburne so <laughs> what's not there so that was like my first kind of glimpse into that and then you just I just saw like the kick ass trailers and you're like man it, this looks like a really good 
action movies. So it's like, you know what? And back then in those days, we went to all kinds of movies. Like, it's not like, you know, like today, we usually kind of go to the big tentpole movies and when we do because it's so expensive, right? Yeah. But back then, it was like, eh, movie looks kind of cool. It's something to do. Let's go to it. And this was kind of one of those movies where, let's go to a movie. I like Keanu Reeves. He's kind of dreamy. <laughs> let's <laughs> yeah. go to it. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, so, and the I was very blown away by this movie. This movie just like, I don't know. You're just like, when you went to it, like you're expecting it to be just a regular action movie, you know, has like some action pieces here. It's got Keanu Reeves doing his, whoa, <laughs> you know, kind of, his, you know, a little bit of his, because yeah. he, he gets a hard time being a wooden actor, but I think he's proven he's, he's great. He's great. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. And the movie became a, a pop culture wide phenomenon really in 1999. Like in the movie, actually, I kind of was a little bit resistant to some of that because of episode one, The Phantom Menace, because yeah, that was my movie. That's where all your attention went. That was yeah. all my attention. So this movie kind of diverted that from me. And this movie came out before The Phantom Menace. So when The Matrix was released, it got uh, they got positive reviews. It was praised for its innovative visual effects, action sequences, and cinematography. Yep. Uh, you can tell, and as you learn... The action was heavily influenced by Japanese animation, martial arts films. Uh, they use actually fight choreographers like and wire for like techniques like from Hong Kong action cinema. And so, anyways, it popularized Bullet Time. You remember like when he's shooting, like that movie. After you saw that, especially in this movie, every movie was copying it, right? Yep. And the thing is, I think I've seen a little bit of it. They do a little bit of the bullet time in Blade, I believe. The first one? Yeah, the first Blade. Hmm. I believe it's where, when, you've seen the first Blade, right? I have. Yeah. So there's like a scene there when the, I think it's the Stephen Dorr vampire, I don't know if they're at a cemetery or something, and he shoots at him, and he kind of dodges bullets in a different way, but okay. I thought that was, but I haven't seen that movie in so long. It's so been a long time. I could be mistaken. Yeah. But anyways... You can look up what bullet time is and stuff. I don't think we need to explain it. I don't think we could do justice for it. But anyway, no. it's a cool action sequence. It kind of revolutionized movies, really, yeah. after this movie, especially The Matrix. Yeah. Because I, I kind of treat it like Michael Jackson did the moonwalk on live TV. He didn't create the moonwalk, but he popularized it. And I think that's what The Matrix did with bullet time. Yeah. Yeah. The Matrix ended up winning four Academy Awards. Uh, it won Best Visual Effects. This one was a surprise for me because I thought Star Wars Episode One: Phantom Mass was a shoe in But with the innovation, yeah. I mean, that, that puts it up yeah. there. Like, yeah. In my opinion, I still think uh, The Phantom Menace and ILM dwarfs it because my one critique of The Matrix, especially watching it now, they use a lot of dark shadows and that so you can True. hide a lot of True. stuff but also i like that cyberpunk dark kind mm. of so it's almost yeah so it's okay and then they won best editing um best sound and best sound editing so this and the thing is like the the action sound and the scene it, it's great and another thing is what i liked about this and i think a lot of people is that it, it, it draws heavily and alludes to numerous cinematic in literary literary works and concepts from mythology, religion, and philosophy, like such as Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, and Judaism, like you can see, it's totally tied. There's all kinds of like religious allegories in this movie. Yeah, there is. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna go back to one thing when I was talking about the comic shop. This movie had a great marketing campaign with like, especially in the early days of the internet. And I don't know, do you remember when you'd see like TV spots or trailers or anything that had the Matrix? It had like www.whatisthematrix.com. Do you remember that? Vaguely. Okay. Yeah, but this movie was yeah, back then, we didn't have this, but yeah. Yeah. No. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that is kind of cool. Yeah, That's, yeah like it's, it's the. The early days of the World Wide Web, so yeah. there wasn't much you could really do other than put the yeah. address across, really. And it was a really good way for, like, to get, like, fans' attention. You know, mm-hmm. it got you, like, interacting, got you thinking, especially yeah. people that were, like, into the philosophical and 
like to kind of think that we're a little bit more on the uptake when it comes to movies and like the hidden meetings into stuff. This was great because it was like you're piecing because the the Dark Knight was heavily praised for its marketing campaign and uh, it kind of innovated that. And I actually I thought uh, actually episode one they were using the internet back then and they had a great marketing campaign as yeah. well. So, but it, it, but the matrix is the one that really stands out. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know, you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there like a splinter in your mind driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Okay, and like I said, uh, the film became a pop culture phenomenon. People were like quoting lines from it. Like if you said you had deja vu, people would say, oh, it must be a glitch in the matrix. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And then also those phones, those kind of sliding phones, uh, that Nokia 8110 mobile phone, it became a kind of a popular item and stuff. You'd say, oh, I sure. In my small city, I saw people with those phones back then. Man, it'd be like carrying a switchblade. It kind of was. <laughs> you, know, you know, people would do that. They're like, <laughs> Yeah. It was like they were almost like, and then also, though, like those big dusters or those long black coats. Mm -hmm. Coats. I like those because it, it it reminded me of like those big dusters they wore in like those Sergio Leone westerns and all those western movies and stuff. And you you see teenagers wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So and also like at this time, um, DVDs, uh, the late nineties, was kind of a new format. Uh, to watch movies, uh, I had a friend that the first time I ever like witnessed because I was still watching VHS. Yeah, I know people had laser discs. Yeah, but then DVDs, and I, it was at his place, and you're over there, and he had the Matrix, and he's like, "I'm like, you're looking at like, what is this?" He goes, "That's a DVD," and I just knew <laughs> what's a hey, DVD. Yeah, what's a DVD? <laughs> and looking yeah. at this, and the thing is, at first I wasn't sold on it. I'm like, eh. "Who was? Who no. was really?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the the movie was basically a catalyst for people to move from VHS and Laserdisc to DVD. Um, and then The Matrix, also this movie, led to groundbreaking, other groundbreaking ideas because they did uh, two sequels. They did video games, The Enter the Matrix. Do you remember that? Did you play that? I did not play it. Uh, but I do hear there is a lot of lore oh. and storytelling in the video game, which mm -hmm. is true to canon. Right, so it's part. It's a part of canon. And wasn't also the. It was also famous for the Matrix Online kind of campaign. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it was like I, not that it was the first online campaign. But no, it was one of the more kind of popular one. Like people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then don't forget the animated series that came out. The Animatrix, well, yeah. I believe. The Animatrix, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this, I've never seen it, but I've always wanted to see it. I've never got my hands I on it. I know. I need to get some because I feel like there's a lot of storytelling in there that we've missed out on. Yeah, but, and you believe it or not, um, I've never owned it on physical copy. I've never owned it on VHS. I've never owned it on DVD, Blu-ray whatsoever. Yeah. I just finally... I had the DVD trilogy, yeah. but since I'm able to get better quality ones now digitally, I might as well just keep those, but yeah. yeah. Like, I can't believe it because I, I love, I, especially this movie, I loved it. And I'm looking forward to rewatching the other ones. But, uh, yeah, uh, the Animatrix really uh, here really expanded the world of the Matrix. Yeah, like, it's it's basically like what Clone Wars is to Star Wars. The Animatrix mm -hmm. is to the Matrix. Yeah. And, like, you see, especially with Animatrix, 
you're seeing today properties, uh, IPs that are doing kind of the same thing. Because look at The Witcher. Uh, the Witcher is going on a second season, and they have a prequel animated movie. And you're mm-hmm. kind of seeing this where they're yeah. expanding these, uh, these these universes and stuff yeah. for the person. Because sometimes you just can't fit it all in a season or in a movie. So, it, again, groundbreaking. Like, the mm-hmm. Wachowskis are very groundbreaking. So, a little bit, if you kind of go back, if you watch, I was watching some of the extras on the DVD and the making of it and how the Wachowskis kind of came about this. Well, the Wachowskis in the early 90s were writing for comic books, which makes sense, right? Yep. Because The Matrix, it, this feels like some type of Japanese comic book. It does. And they did. They actually did a. a, a they wrote uh, for Marvel. Actually, they wrote. I think it was Echo Kid or something. Was there? Oh. Yeah. So okay. They, there's kind of a, a Marvel connection, and then they wrote some stories for Hellraiser and Nightbreed, which was based on Clive Barker's work. You know, the Hellraiser guy, the Pinhead. Are you kind of familiar? never saw Hellraiser, yeah. but I heard about it. Yeah, Clive Barker was kind of famous for those those kind of, I don't know, esoteric. Kind of, I don't know. I, I can't explain it. That's not really mine, but it now it kind of makes sense. Mm. You see kind of some of the imageries and like with the long coats and the leather. You mm. saw it with Pinhead and those kind of creatures and stuff. So kind of like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, like we said, uh, the Wachowskis are huge f- fans of Hong Kong cinema, science fiction, Japanese animation. And this actually, this, these, Three things led them to write the conceptual for The Matrix. Um, and actually, it, I don't know if you knew, but at the time, they were actually going to write... The, the Matrix was going to be a comic book or a comic series. Oh, that would have been awesome. But they ended up developing it into a, a bigger thing because they both were trying to get into filmmaking. Yeah. Right, so, Dave Filoni, eh? Yeah. Yeah, how do you... Yeah, that's crazy. Um, like, how you pitch that to get it... You know, you don't have a lot of background stuff for the matrix but maybe the script just wowed them so good that yeah that they were like yeah do it let's do it well th- that's kind of what really happened and i never knew this but they wrote three scripts and they probably were shopping around and i think they took it to warner brothers and they had three uh scripts one was assassins that's with sly stallone and antonio banderas hmm. i've never seen the movie I heard it was kind of like a really bad film. Okay. But you actually, you you, you find out. Uh, and so they presented this to Warner Brothers in 94. And Joel Silver, who's actually the producer of the Matrix films, he got involved and yada yada. But Assassins kind of, when they did the film and stuff, it went with the lots of rewrites. Uh, so it basically wasn't really their story. And then it was taken over like for directing because the Wachowskis wanted to direct that. But they gave it to Richard Donner. Okay. But the movie was like a mess and stuff. Box office. Hmm. Together, Talked was. about Richard Donner before. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Richard Donner. Yeah. And But their second uh, script that they gave, they actually got to direct it. And it became a critical and financial success. And they only had like a $3 million budget. So the success of this movie bound led to the studios to agree for the Wachowski brothers to write and direct The Matrix. And they got a significant budget, $63 million. So, yeah, that's kind of, you know, based on the success of Bound, they got to do this. But I think they were worried that a movie like this Probably for a studio, there was lots of comprehension. You have new, you know, sec, you know, second movie directors, a huge budget. They're unproven. Yeah, you could you could almost worry that the movie would have been taken from them, like another director, or they would have been heavily edited. Your usual run of the mill kind of action film, but it wasn't. the The movie was very deep in philosophical themes, and I think one of the problems with the studio about doing this film is that they thought a lot of people couldn't understand these themes. That was a concern earlier on in the filming. And will the general audience get it? Because usually filmmakers and a lot of studios think the general audience is kind of... Stupid? Stupid. Yeah. And they are. They, <laughs> no, but they, they really don't give the audience enough credit. Like, yeah. if you want a successful film, you, you yeah. need to let the audience think a little bit. 
Yeah. And that's what intrigues people to come back and watch your stuff again. Yeah. Or continue watching your franchise. Mm. So mm. don't just put out like dumb, lazy shit out mm. there. Like put out stuff that's going to make you think. Mm-hmm. You know, even when you leave the theater and like say you're with someone and they go, yeah, I thought this was, you know, I thought when he said that it meant this. And he goes, no, because when I heard him say it, I thought he meant that. So like it's always good to have a difference in opinion in films and it creates discussion and it creates um fandom and then that's how you get the rise of a film so you yeah. just need that discussion and that starts from making a film that makes you think a little it does and then it, it really helps when you have the people that are making the film say the directors or the writers and they're very passionate and they're 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 very you know they make you believe in what they're doing and that's what the wachowskis did and they storyboarded the whole film because in those days, in a lot of films, they didn't just storyboard everything. Like you know, they had they would storyboard like certain action sequences right. or certain big stuff that, that would cost a lot of the budget. Where they did the whole movie in storyboards, and I, I believe like George Lucas did this with the prequels, and that gave the studio a huge confidence in the Wachowskis. So and then yeah, it was they're off and running. And then they went and filmed in Australia because they probably get bang for their buck for their budget. Yeah. Uh, and this goes into now casting the film. And this is pretty knowledge, and you and I were kind of talking about this in the early stage of uh, casting. Will Smith was kind of initially was offered the role. Right. And did you know he turned it down for another movie that came out in 1999 was The Wild Wild West? Oh, right. So, so Another could, cyberpunk western. A cyberpunk western, big budget. Yep. I don't know, man. Like, I'm glad he did because... Well, I, me too. I, you know, For sure. Like, uh, you know, I like Will Well, Smith, hindsight's twenty twenty. We, You know, we're yeah. in the future now. We're, we're looking back on a film. Yeah. So we really don't know how it would have been with Will Smith. Maybe he could have pulled it off. I don't know. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know. You know, we would be sitting here thinking, well, I wish Keanu Reeves would have got the mm-hmm. job, but we don't know. I think right. Will Smith, I know he might have been at those uh, time a little younger, but I think he would have been better suited uh, as a uh, Morpheus type character, like kind of still leading. He might yeah. have been at that time a little young to play. To, maybe a little young. Because, yeah, like like a mentor yeah. and stuff. But it, I don't know. I just, I don't see him. But again, the hindsight's 20 Exactly, exactly. But, yeah. you know, having seen what we've seen, you and I can both agree that the casting is just one of the highlights of the film. It is. And another person that was considered for it was actually Nicolas Cage. Would you believe that? Oh, God. Can you imagine <laughs> him playing it like the accent he had in, like, Con Air? Oh, oh. put the Bonnie back in the box. <laughs> <laughs> no way. No. no way. And actually, apparently, Johnny Depp was uh, the Wachowski's first choice. I mean, I'm sure he would have done okay. Uh, I mean, Johnny Depp is an amazing actor. Mm-hmm. He There is nothing really he can't do. Like, he's proven he can do anything. Yeah. Um, so I suppose he could have done this, but I'm just glad that we got what we got, and um, I'm happy uh, that uh, we're talking about it today. So am I. <laughs> and so this leads us to Keanu Reeves. So then they finally, okay, let's get Keanu Reeves. And the thing is, it makes sense with Keanu Reeves because he was in Point Break. I've never seen that movie. That's a movie on my to see list. <sighs> I've seen it, but I, I don't remember a lot of it, but I did see it. And then Speed, so he, you can tell he's had a lot of experience with action genres with that. Yeah, what was that one that he was in with Morgan Freeman? Do you remember that one? Chain Reaction. Chain Reaction, another good uh, yeah. kind of an action film type, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good. And actually, he was in a cyberpunk genre type movie, movie that I think that was, it's called Johnny in Mnemonic. Never seen it. I heard about it, but I'd never seen that one. My dad and I were actually were watching that like a while ago. <laughs> It's nowhere in the quality of The Matrix or some of these other films, but it is a kind of interesting concept. Okay, what's it about? Oh, geez, I don't know if I can explain it, but basically, it's a guy that has a program that's inserted into his head, and okay. people want it. It's, it's a future, but I don't know. It's... <laughs> Like really campy? Or? I don't know. I just like watched like oh, okay. maybe the first twenty minutes of it. So okay. if someone yeah. <laughs> you might have to, but yeah. But I might have to check it out one day. But anyways, the point is is that cyberpunk genre, he has kind of he knows this niche. Yeah, yeah, he's you know. good at it. Yeah. yeah. And uh then uh, Morpheus, Lawrence Fishburne uh obviously was cast as him. Amazing. Uh well, yeah, he's he I don't know how you could he he's he's 
the Obi Wan of this trilogy. He really is. Yeah. He really is. He he plays a father figure to Neo. Yeah. He really does. He's and, awesome. And I don't think he's that much older than Keanu Reeves in real life. Uh, no, maybe not. No, like he plays a, like a good big brother, but he yeah. has such gravitas that you believe him that he could be like a father. Just, oh, every word yeah. he says, and then his look, like. Lawrence Fishburne has, like, a look of authority. You just, yep. when you see him, and everything I've seen, I remember seeing him in Boys, Boy, um, not Boys to Men. <laughs> Boys in the ABC Hood. ABC DVD. <laughs> Boys in the Hood, or he was in Nightmare on Elm Street uh, Part 3. Everything I would see him, he was in actually Apocalypse Now. Uh, he's really young in that film. But everything he's in there, he has a look. He kind of, There's just something about Lawrence Fishburne yep. that you, you, you're just drawn to him. Anything he does, whether he plays, like, a, like a Morpheus type character, or he plays a, uh, just a, like a straight protagonist, or even an antagonist. You 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 just enjoy him and at he, times. Sorry, at times in this franchise, he is my favorite character. Oh, he yeah, he really is. Yeah, it'll be interesting in the Resurrections, but anyways, we'll, yeah. we'll get to that. Yep, later in this podcast. Interesting, he wasn't the first choice in this movie. Uh, one choice was initially was Samuel L. Jackson. Hey, motherfucker! Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? And you will know my name is the Lord! Mm. Anyways, I think it would be interesting if Samuel Jackson... Samuel Jackson, sure. Samuel Jackson, like, he's fantastic. But he's very flamboyant, and I, I think Morpheus isn't a flamboyant <laughs> no. character. I just wonder if Sam could pull it off. I don't know. Hard to say. V- very true. Uh, there is, there, this rumor was debunked, but there was a rumor that Sean Connery was going to be cast as Morpheus in this. But that was debunked. Yeah. But there is a long-standing thing with Sean Connery. He turned down so many, like, big mainstream movies. He was actually, I think they wanted him to play Gandalf. He turned that down. And I think that one he could pull off. He could. Yeah. But he turned that one down. And that was what the kind of legend to eventually doing the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I love that movie. That's actually a fun movie. I think I prefer the graphic novel, but okay. I'd have to I'm not a reader, again. so <laughs> <laughs> we know. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, eh? But yeah, so but yeah, anyways, uh another person that they initially were gonna offer to and to me this would have been a really interesting one. Uh, Gary Oldman, because I, I, mm. I always like Gary Oldman's like the chameleon, uh, in my opinion. Right, he can play anything. He can go in makeup. He's just one of those guys, or just those actors that he, you can whatever. It's a small bit. Uh, Johnny a, Depp for me, I think too. He really can. Yeah, maybe John, not as good as Gary. No, Oldman. Johnny. Johnny Depp is way more mainstream known. Like he's a bigger star. True. So, it's hard, like, Johnny Depp, is, he's very diverse as an actor, yeah. but Gary Oldman's one of those guys, I didn't know he was in Hannibal, because his names weren't in the credit, he wasn't promoted. Okay. So I didn't know at first, when I first watched Hannibal, I'm like, mm. this freaking Gary Oldman? Because like, his names are not in the credit, his name's not in the credit. Well, so, like, where was he in Hannibal? He plays a guy that, like, eats himself, or has he's all scarred up, and he wants to get revenge on Hannibal. Oh. Uh, I don't know if his name's Mason or some. I, okay, I'm butchering the names. Okay, that's I'm fine. sure people know that. Just you can yeah. go look it on Wikipedia. Hmm. I don't know that you know, but he was really good in that, and like everything. So I thought he'd be interesting playing in it because if you look back and him playing Sirius Black, he can play a mentor character that guides the hero. So yeah. I, it'd be interesting what he could do. I would I would have been interested in seeing Gary Oldman as Morpheus, but like you said, Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, you know. Yep, hands down. Hands down. And then we get uh, Kiria Moss that plays Trinity. And basically, we she didn't really do too much before this. This is the movie that really made her put her on the map. Yeah, no, um, she was she was wonderful. Um, yeah. She was awesome and not not bad to look at either. She was great. Yeah, she wasn't bad. But to be honest with you, uh, this is like my one criticism. Well, maybe my one criticism of The Matrix, it was kind of hard to see her as this, you know, because maybe I'll get into late, you know, like she's supposed to be this all loving of Neo and stuff. And I don't know if it's because you grew up in that futuristic world and stuff. She didn't just, she kind of came off really kind of cold. Not that uh, I, I loved you, it. You mean at first? I mean, well, throughout the whole, I, I didn't really buy this, this, you know, uh, across the stars, love relationship between the two. No, I mean, it wasn't, no, you're right. It wasn't like that. Like, it wasn't like, 
you know, a, a rom-com or something where they're like head over heels over each other. Yeah. But um, you could see that she she did look after him, you know, like she always like she she brought him food and, you know, so maybe, we'll, maybe we'll touch on that. When we yeah, we'll get into that. But I, I'm, I'm just saying that the gun, yeah. it, it showed that yeah. she did care, maybe not in a flamboyant way, but it wasn't really out there. But uh, she did. Maybe maybe I'm fo- I was focusing more on the dialogue and the way what the dialogue could mean. But True. Anyways, I, I love her in the movies. Like, I have nothing wrong, uh, anything against her, how what she acted and what she did. I just thought the character, the way they described her and the way the character was, was like, ah, she's not that. But that's my only criticism yeah. in this movie. But she's great. And did you know that actually uh, Janet Jackson was initially uh, uh. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, hey, I got hey, nothing to say. I mean, she, <laughs> she, she's an actor. She She's made quite a few feature films. So, meh. She's not for me for acting. I mean, <laughs> did I listen to her uh, to yeah. her albums on my cassette player back to back? Yeah, for sure I did. But for acting, I don't really care for her. Yeah, she can sing all day. Well, I, I think we we they went with uh, <laughs> Carrie Moss was the right choice. You know, yeah. so she's and I, I. Anyways, we'll go into this uh, one of my next part after. But let's finish off with Hugo Weaving as Agent Smith. Brilliant. He's the sentinel being of uh, that. Yeah, he's he's the villain. Yep. He's the, like one of the greatest villains. And like you said, outside of Lawrence Fishburne, I think uh, Hugo Weaving steals every scene he's in. He is very captivating. Yeah. I can't look away. Like he yeah. is amazing. Just how how he um, s- talked, spoke, and oh acted and yeah, stuff. his uh, speech was just like I said, captivating. It just drew you in. You could not look away when he talked. It was amazing. Yeah. Um. And did you know initially the the role was offered to John Reno, the 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 hitman in the Professional? Do you know who John? I did Reno? not watch the Professional. Gary Oldman is awesome. In that movie he okay. steals the show as the villain, and that has the film debut of Natalie Portman, who equally almost steals the show. Oh. And it's a great great show, and he's kind of famous for that. Um, um, but he was, and I'm glad because like I, I like him as an actor, but I, I don't think I. Him, the type of actor he is, would have been a right fit for Morpheus. Am I? Or, uh, not, not Morpheus. Agent Smith. Agent Smith. Just right. Hugo Weaving all the way. Yep. Okay, so now that they have the cast, the cast was required to understand and explain the Matrix. So and to do this, before they got a script, especially the main ones, they had to read three books... This would help them to fully understand the themes that were presented by the Wachowskis in the movie. That's movies. a really good idea. Just saying, do, do a lot of filmmakers do that to their actors and actresses? Do they kind of provide them with some literature to kind of get into the world? Well, it's very interesting because depending on like the type of movie or um, who's involved with it, that might determine. But usually movies, it's like time is against them. Right. So, but some filmmakers like Francis Ford Coppola kind of comes, you know, he's like a director, uh, you know, you can think of like people that come from like Val Kilmer comes from the Juilliard or whatever, the school. Right. They went to school. I don't know where Francis Ford Coppola, I don't know if he went to the same director school that George Lucas and Brian De Palma all did. But okay. Anyways, he would like to rehearse one of his movies. So you'd like to get together with the cast and rehearse it. Kind of like, you know, like opera or a play. Rehearse it, rehearse it, and stuff. But a lot of times, a lot of actors or people don't do it, or time. Yeah. Uh, and then also, actually, Alfonso Coren, who directed the third Harry Potter film, The Prisoner of Azkaban, when he came over and took over for Christopher Columbus, he went to uh, both Dan Radcliffe, Emma Watson, and Rupert Grant, who played Harry, Hermione, and Ron, and he got them to write requested them to write an essay about who they think their character is okay. at that point. And That's so, cool. So, yeah, like, I guess it depends on the filmmaker yeah. and stuff. Some will go that extra mile. Because I think if you talk to, like, if you listen to Mark Hamill, anytime he talks about the classic Star Wars or even that, he, in his mind, he kind of develops a backstory for the character, even though it's not on screen, but it helps him emote and all this and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of that. So the, the three books... And this one that was at the Simulacara and Simulation. Right. And we see this actually in the movie where it hides Neo's little hacking discs. 
So yes. you see it pretty blatantly. So I thought that was kind of a, a cool little. That's Easter a cool egg. Easter egg. Yeah. Yeah. And then one's out of control, and the other one is evolutionary psychology. And if you look these up, uh, you, they'll kind of you can understand why uh, the Wachowskis got the, the actors to read these books and stuff because it really does tie to the themes and the philosophy of their script. Mm -hmm. Now, now that you say that the other books, I may have to go rewatch that scene where he's in his room and see if I can point out those other books maybe hiding somewhere. Well, it's somewhere. possible, yeah. 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 Uh, and also, another great thing about The Matrix is the they hired a Chinese martial arts choreographer and film director, uh, Un Wun Ping. And he's famous for uh, making movies with Jackie Chan, a uh, bunch of his. Nice. One I really like, and I don't know if you've seen this, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Have not. You, you, yeah, you gotta see that one. Don't you? roast me. But to Kill Bill. <laughs> the Kill Bill Holmes. You've seen those. Not yet. Don't roast me. <laughs> Move see what, on. See what I'm dealing with here? This is this is this is arduous, but okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so Alright. Now uh, when they brought in Un Wu Ping, and I, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing the name right. English is my first language, but obviously I have not mastered it. But he thought uh, the filmmakers, uh, the Wachowskis thought, well, four months of training and choreographing and all this is all they need. And he, uh, Wing thought, oh, I really need two. But then when he uh, um, observed the actors and actresses, he realized they. They didn't even know how to throw a punch or a kick <laughs> to so, and they were very unfit. As, oh wow! As, you know, not, not like probably like fit to have those long sequence fights. Yeah. So okay. he he used every four months. Nice. <laughs> and actually, to make things worse, prior to pre production, uh, Keanu Reeves suffered a two level fusion of his cervical spine. Oh damn! Yeah, which actually started to cause paralysis in his legs and you can imagine his legs you're making a movie like this like fudge really yeah so he had to undergo neck surgery recovering but so he was recovering and now they're in pre-production you know reeves like the kind of caliber person he's he a hard is, worker yeah. he insisted on to train and he could not kick for two months out of the four months training wow like you imagine just having neck surgery and all this and now you're making this heavily action choreographed film and if you notice he didn't kick much in the film also you can see he doesn't really move his head at all during the fights if you stop and really kind of think about it now i have to watch for that yeah so if, yeah now you gotta go back why did you tell me this before yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well this is the best part of i it, know right? we save it yeah. for the podcast you know like until you know this or find out this information, you don't think of it. You don't watch it because everything's so seamless. You're so yeah. caught up in the characters and the actions. And the story. And now, but like yeah. you really think like he does, he does kick people here or there, but he mostly doesn't. He usually it's a lot of like, punching, a lot of punching, yep. and a lot of guns. <laughs> oh, I love the guns. Uh, Wing also. This is kind of I. I really found this tidbit very interesting. He wrote the actor's fight style based on certain things that he found. So. He found with Reeves, he, he, he wrote Diligence. He wrote for Fishburne, Resilience. He wrote for weaving, uh, Hugo Weaving, Precision. And it makes sense because when you watch him punch, everything is precise. He doesn't waste any punches. Yep. And I thought Carrie uh, Ann Moss's was the most interesting. Feminine Grace. Um, and like what he said, he let their body develop. Yep. And then he worked with each to build their strengths. Uh, and another thing is about this film, like Carrie Moss hurt her ankle. Weaving actually had to have hip surgery. No way. Yeah. So, wow. and then obviously the the fight uh, stunt people, a bunch of them got hurt. Yeah. So lots of lots of injuries. Yeah. So that's about it for a little of those extra tidbits on the Matrix. That's some good stuff. <laughs> Show me.
Okay then, that will conclude part one of our Matrix Roundtable, and we look forward to you joining us for part two as we take a deeper dive down the rabbit hole that is the Matrix. You can find us on Spotify, Podbean, uh, Google Podcasts, Audible, Audible, Amazon Music, and YouTube. And you can get a hold of us on Twitter. If you have any questions and you want to interact with us, then uh, get a hold of us on Twitter at Turk and Raz. Yeah, Turk and Raz. Yeah, thanks for listening. Talk to you again. See ya. What number are we thinking of? 69, dudes!